Hi, everyone. You are listening to the 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast, coming to you from the still lockdown area of Niagara region in southern Ontario, Canada. I'm your host, Rick Cole, and each week we go on a trip back in time 50 years to report on all the hockey news from that period. This week, we're looking at the period of June 15 to 21, 1970. Our podcast is made possible by the support of our two sponsors. Newspapers.com is the world's largest online newspaper archive, and without their support, we would not be able to bring you all the sports news from that long ago time period. And the Breakwall Brewing Company is located in beautiful downtown Port Coburn, Ontario. And even during this pandemic, they continue to produce some of the best craft beers available in Canada. They also have some outstanding pub food and it's available yet for takeout and when this pandemic clears up i'd love to meet any of our listeners at the break wall for a beer and a burger last week we gave you a couple of episodes a bonus episode in addition to our regular news program we covered all the news from the national hockey league's annual summer get together in montreal and in the bonus episode we provided a blow-by-blow account of the buffalo vancouver expansion draft and we also gave you some highlights of the amateur draft in which the sabers made gilbert perot the first selection this week some of the stories we're looking at include that convoluted struggle to determine the ownership of the oakland seals it continued in a couple of california courtrooms Uh, We heard about a lot of uh, player signings, both junior graduates and veterans, many who were joining new teams. And this week, we have a bit of news on Michelle Briere's ongoing battle to recover from injuries suffered in that auto accident in which he was involved on May 15th. While there isn't a ton of news this week, some of it's very complicated, so we'll try and make it as clear for you as we can. Let's get to it. With the National Hockey League meetings, expansion and amateur drafts, and most of the player trading done for the offseason, the hockey news that received the most attention this week was the ongoing saga of that terrible Oakland Seals franchise. As we all know, the ownership question for this moribund franchise has been placed in the hands of a California judge when it became apparent that the present owners, Transnational Communications of New York, had defaulted on payments they were required to make as a result of their original purchase agreement from a company called Seals Limited, uh, with its head being Barry Van Gerbig. About a week before uh, this week, the judge in that case had ruled that Charles O. Finley, the owner of Major League Baseball's Oakland Athletics, would become the new owner of the team with an offer to purchase of $3.4 million. But that was not at by any means the end of the story and this week that we're looking at, there were more developments that seemed to cloud things up more than ever. On Monday morning of the week, no less than 11 lawyers connected with the various factions involved in this lawsuit or had interest in this case huddled at the request of Judge Robert Snacky in his chambers in an effort to hammer out some sort of concrete agreement as to the future of the team. The judge was to try and determine if he could validate his original ruling that awarded the team to Finley for that price tag of what had eventually inflated to $4.1 million. This behind closed doors conference was at the request of the judge, uh, not of the lawyers or any other uh, particularly involved party. And it began at the time that the Monday scheduled hearing was to take place. Now, one of the things that uh, clouded the whole issue uh, and, and really made it rather confusing after the judge's ruling the previous Tuesday that gave the team to Finley was that Jerry Seltzer, an Oakland, uh, he's an Oakland sportsman who owns the Professional Roller Derby League, he submitted a belated offer uh, for the Seals of $4.5 million, $400,000 more than Finley's offer. Then... 
just to throw another monkey wrench into the works in a completely separate bankruptcy hearing before a different judge, a federal judge, which is a little higher than Judge Snacky, uh, TNC, that's Transnational Communications, the people had bought the team from Seals Limited, they were declaring bankruptcy and then they requested more time to arrange payment of their debts to circumvent the bankruptcy, including the money they were found to have defaulted in paying that led to Judge Snacky's ruling. Are you lost yet? Well, what was going on was that Transnational Communication and the Knox Brothers of Buffalo, New York, the owners of the new Buffalo Sabres NHL franchise, had obtained a restraining order the previous Thursday to block the enforced sale of the team to Finley, and on Monday, they requested that order be enforced. So that's how this conference with 11 lawyers came to be arranged on Monday morning. Later on Monday, bankruptcy referee, a federal judge, Sheridan Downey Jr., not Robert Downey Jr., gave conditional approval to Jerry Seltzer to make a formal bid to purchase the seals in direct competition to the bid made by Charlie Finley. Downey Jr. requested that lawyers return to his offices on Tuesday with an agreement that Seltzer would be allowed to present his offer to purchase the seals to the National Hockey League Board of Governors along with Finley during the Board of Governor meetings in Montreal on June 26th to 27th. Judge Schnacke, whose decision is now preempted by the federal court ruling, had waited to see what that ruling would be, and that's why he called the meeting. Had this decision not been reached, Schnacke would then have awarded Finley the seals for the $4.1 million price tag. Downey's ruling supersedes that. Uh, clear as mud, right? It was really... It was confusing to those involved as it is to those who were just observers. The bottom line of all this is that transnational communications is being given some time to work itself out of its debt and the Knox brothers are being given time to realize a better return for their 20% stake in the SEALs team. The Knoxes will then divest themselves of that interest when the sale of the team takes place to either Finlay or Seltzer as they were required to do by the National Hockey League bylaws governing, governing team ownership. So late Tuesday afternoon, Judge Schnacke approved the Seltzer bid, given it was $400,000 higher than the one from Finley. He signed papers that cleared the way for the sale of the team and recommended that Seltzer's bid be the one approved by the NHL Board of Governors, simply because it was a uh, put the uh, sellers in a much better cash position. However, the decision didn't really do anything other than confirm that the Board of Governors will be able to review both bids and ultimately it seems that the decision of the National Hockey League Board of Governors will be the one that is finally binding. Of course, the Board of Governors is very happy with this development. Why wouldn't they be? They're anticipating, hoping, nay, praying that this situation could evolve into a bidding war which would artificially drive up the value of this terrible franchise. Many would say that the $4.5 million that Seltzer has offered is grossly inflated and uh, fin Finley's original uh, submission which was $3.4 million, while admittedly a lowball offer, really more closely reflected the value of the Oakland Seals. For his part, Barry Van Gerbig, remember him? He's the guy who started this whole mess by selling the team to a uh, buyer that really wasn't viable. He says he really doesn't care who wins the franchise as long as he gets his money. So now, we wait until sometime between June 25th and June 29th, which seems to be the date the NHL says a decision would be made. And maybe then this sorry episode of NHL franchise ownership history might finally be resolved. The Board of Governors say they meet on the 25th, but apparently they're saying they're convening a special meeting to review both applications, and that'll be on June 29th and a decision is expected quite quickly. 
Now, one other note to all this mess. On Thursday of the this week we're studying, now that it was clear that transnational communication was out of the picture, at least as far as the SEALs were concerned, that company announced that they had concluded an agreement to merge with Madison Square Garden Limited, owners of the New York Rangers. The Board of Governors for each corporation still had to approve required stock transfers, and TNC, in making this announcement, then asked to have its bankruptcy application be dismissed. What an unholy, stinking mess this whole thing has been. Of course, there was some non-monetary, non-business-related hockey news this this week, and, and, and we have that for you, too. Uh, first up, the Vancouver Canucks had hired former National Hockey League referee Vern Buffy, and it's good to see Vern get a job. He was a loyal employee to the NHL, although uh, Clarence Campbell might not say so because Buffy did prove to be a thorn in his side from time to time. Well, Vern will assume the role of a scout for the new Canucks franchise. He'll be based in the Montreal area and he'll cover uh, most of Eastern Canada and he'll scout professionals and amateurs there and also have a look at some United States college players in the Eastern section of that country. Boston Bruins general manager Milt Schmidt was busy this week as he signed three of the players that the Boston club took with their four selections in the NHL amateur draft just passed. Inking deals with the Stanley Cup champs were center Rick McLeish, defenseman Ron Plum, who both played for Peterborough in the Ontario Hockey Association last year, and another OHA grad, London Knights goalie, Daniel Bouchard. Of course, no terms were disclosed on any of these deals. Bit of news from the New York Rangers. Defenseman Arnie Brown underwent surgery on his right knee for removal of cartilage. Uh, he injured the knee during the playoff series against Boston, and it's expected that Arnie will be ready for the Rangers training camp in September. The Philadelphia Flyers were a little busy this week. First of all, they concluded a deal that uh, they made before the May tr trading deadline in which they sent youngster Larry McKillop to the American Hockey League Hershey Bears along with a player to be named later. Uh, that was in exchange for veteran defenseman Barry Ashby, a real character guy who should make the Flyers in the fall training camp. Well, the player to be named later has been named a little bit later, and he is defenseman Daryl Edestrand, who's been bouncing around pro hockey for the last few years. I had a good uh, season early in the expansion with St. Louis, and now he becomes a member of the Hershey Bears. The Flyers also completed a deal, which will see every one of their games be on TV or radio next season. For the first time in their history, the Flyers will broadcast all 39 home games in their entirety on local radio. Uh, I think it's radio station WCAU. The Flyers, however, will still play second fiddle to the NBA 76ers and especially on TV. When there's a broadcasting conflict, station WCAU will carry the National Basketball Association game and join the Flyers game in the third period or at some other point in the game in which is still in progress. Here's a trend we think could uh, catch on throughout Canada. The Calgary Minor Hockey Association has become the first loop, minor hockey loop, kids hockey, to ban the use of curd sticks in their games. We, we wondered at the time if the Toronto organization, as well as others around Canada, would follow suit and ban the banana blade. 
Some news about Harry Sinden that you may or may not have heard during all the flap about his retiring. Uh, the Bruins' Phil Esposito said that he expects Harry Sinden will be back behind an NHL bench and he thinks it's going to happen a lot sooner than most people think. Now, Espo says that during this past hockey season, in fact, not long after Christmas, Harry had sort of given the Bruins players an inkling that he just might leave the team at the end of the season. Now, Phil wasn't sure whether Harry was just using that kind of uh, rhetoric as a, a motivational uh, speech or whether he was letting his players in on how he was really feeling. But it was proven by the end of the year, Harry left the Bruins. Charlie Hodge made his name in the NHL as uh, mainly the caddy, backup goalie, injury replacement for Jacques Plante of the Montreal Canadiens in the 1950s, and he became the first regular goalkeeper for the Oakland Seals after the 1967 expansion. Well, Charlie was in Vancouver this week, eager to talk contract with his new team. Of course, he was drafted by the Canucks from the Seals in the expansion draft. Charlie apparently told Coach Hal Laco and General Manager Bud Poyle that he is prepared to play every one of Vancouver's 78 games next season. Well, Bud Poyle said he's pleased with Hodge's attitude, and why wouldn't you be? But he didn't think it'd be necessary for uh, Charlie to play quite that many games. Hodge played only sparingly with the Seals last season, and uh, he lost his number one job to Gary Smith at that point. Charlie, later in the week, became the answer to a trivia question as he was the very first player to sign a contract with the expansion team later in the week. Now, now here's a story from earlier in the week. Uh, a couple of NHL all-time greats kind of uh, by good fortune running into each other. Uh, former NHL great goalie Turk Broda paid a visit to Woodbine Raceway in Toronto this week. A and if you knew Turk... Uh, he was a frequent visitor to Woodbine Raceway. Anyway, he went there wearing a suit and he broke out an old tie he'd been hiding in a drawer for years, uh, figuring no one would recognize these ancient threads that suddenly had become rather stylish again. As he entered the dining room at Woodbine to grab a bite to eat and maybe a beverage, who was sitting there but former Toronto Maple Leafs captain and uh, old teammate Teeter Kennedy. Teeter looked at the Turk and shocked him by saying, Hey Turk, I see you were in that old tie. I remember when you bought that thing in New York. That probably took place in the late 1940s. Y'all will remember last week we talked about Bobby Russo, the Montreal Canadiens fine right winger who was traded to the North Stars in that very complicated deal that saw Jude Druin, Ted Harris, Claude LaRose, Bill Collins also change teams between the two franchises. Rumors uh, were abounding. In fact, Bobby himself had told people that if he were to be traded by Canadians during the offseason, he'd probably just retire and the rumors were strong that he wasn't going to report to Minnesota. Well, Russo himself put an end to all those stories by telling Minnesota General Manager Ren Blair that not only would he suit up with the North Stars next season, but the offer of a contract they had made to him was just fine, and he signed it right away. In a related story, amid complaints that Blair and Habs general manager Sammy Pollock had pulled something illegal with that complicated maneuvering to make the trade, National Hockey League President Clarence Campbell was asked to look into this uh, transaction to see if it was abiding by National Hockey League rules and regulations by a couple of teams, neither of which were named. Uh, Campbell said that he reviewed the trade and he found, of course, that nothing untoward had taken place. Now, maybe that is because most NHL rec uh, regulations and rules are written in such a way that there are loopholes that you could drive a Mack truck through. The North Stars also announced that they have sold forward Richard Sentees to the 
Denver Spurs of the Western Hockey League. Uh, Richard Senti spent most of last season with the Iowa Stars, the North Stars top farm team, which was then in the uh, Central Hockey League. But he was also on loan to Denver for the final three weeks of the year. He liked it in Denver. Denver liked Dick. So they arranged to have him sold there. And the North Stars, uh, since they did drop that Iowa farm team in the CHL, moved the farm franchise to the American Hockey League Cleveland Barons. Then they hired the Barons general manager, coach, to be their coach in the NHL. So Cleveland needed a coach and a general manager, and that problem was solved. John Muckler was named general manager of the American Hockey League Barons, and former NHL player Parker McDonald was appointed coach. Both of those guys were in the Iowa operation for Minnesota last year. Bernie Boom Boom Jeffreyan, who was the coach of the Rangers uh, for a while, his health forced him out of that position. He took on the post of assistant general manager of the Rangers, basically right-hand man to general manager coach Emil Francis. Well, the Boomer is leaving New York and heading back to Montreal. The Boomer, of course, because of family considerations, wants to be back in Montreal. Can't blame him there. But that doesn't mean that he's completely uh, leaving the organi- the Rangers organization and going to work for someone else. Uh, the Boomer is going to take up uh, some scouting for the Rangers in the uh, province of Quebec and maybe elsewhere in eastern Canada as well. It's a sure bet, though, that uh, Jeffrey Ann is giving up his $27,000 a year salary as assistant general manager. Scouts make nowhere near that much. Bruins defenseman Ted Green says he's going to be ready for training camp this fall and he expects to play a full season with the Bruins next year. Now you'll remember Ted suffered that terrible fractured skull during the stick swinging duel in last fall's uh, training camp exhibition games with Wayne Mackey, then of the St. Louis Blues, now with the expansion Vancouver Canucks. Ted missed the entire 69-70 season after going a couple of brain surgeries to remove blood clots. Uh, Ted very nearly had not only his career but his life ended by that incident. And it's good to see he's getting back on the ice. Uh, Ted will engage in an intense 10-week conditioning program in Boston later this summer. But at the time, uh, right now, he was working on opening Ted Green Sportsland, which was located on the Trans-Canada Highway just outside his home pe- his hometown of Winnipeg, Manitoba. <laughs> The Calgary Stampede, one of the biggest annual events in the entire uh, country of Canada. Uh, They have a huge parade each year, and they've named two NHL stars as marshals of the Grand Parade. They are Boston Bruin right winger Johnny McKenzie and uh, Detroit Red Wings young star Gary Unger, both Alberta natives, and they will be the guests of honor at the parade and share the ceremonial duties of the event. And this is a very big deal in Calgary, and those two guys are perfect for this job. A little bit more Seals actual hockey news. Even though their ownership status is still undetermined, up in the air, and nobody really knows if they're going to have a job next week, let alone next season, uh, the Seals ended up signing a couple of amateur players to contracts. Frank Selke Jr. trying... uh, to get ahead of the, the game a little bit. Uh, the 20-year-olds are Bob McAneely and Alan Langlaw. Uh, both of them were not drafted in the recent National Hockey League amateur draft, but the Seals, uh, their scouts saw something they liked. They petitioned the NHL and were allowed to add both young players to their negotiation list, and this week they signed contracts. The Ontario Hockey Association Junior A Series held its annual overage midget draft this week. The first pick in the draft overall belonged to the Niagara Falls Flyers, who were truly a terrible team last year. And if any team needed a first round, uh, first overall pick, it was the Flyers, owned by former Bruins GM Hap Ems. He's owned the team for years, actually. The player chosen by the Flyers was forward. Paulin Bordelow of the Montreal Junior Canadiens, uh, he was a midget player, midget age player who saw action with the Junior Habs last year, but he was still subject to the draft and the Falls Flyers grabbed him. Now, 
Ems, Hap Ems, was asked if he would consider trading Paul and Bortolo back to the baby Hap so that he continue to play closer to home. Hap Ems replied, sure, I'll send them back to Montreal for five players and $10,000. I can guarantee Mr. Ems that ain't going to happen. Well, those wonderful charitable men at the board of the Maple Leaf Gardens directors has shown just how charitable they can be to their fans. As this week, they voted to hold the line on ticket prices for all Maple Leaf games for the 1970-71 season. That's right, no ticket increase for a team that was flat out awful last year. I can't believe that the board of directors couldn't come up for a reason to try and take more money out of a sold out rink. Now, Stafford Smythe, the president of the team, said that they couldn't very well raise the cost of tickets given the awful performance the team put on last year. Smythe said that when the team is in last place, the players can't ask for raises and neither should the owners. So it looks like Maple Leaf players don't expect any raises from your team this year, even if you're a guy like Ron Ellis who had a career year. Also, uh, Maple Leaf News, uh, Bill Hewitt, who does the Leafs play-by-play on TV, he's the president of CKFH Radio in Toronto. CKFH stands for CK, Foster Hewitt. Foster Hewitt founded this radio station. He says, uh, that's Bill Hewitt, says that the station has signed on to broadcast all Toronto Maple Leaf games home and away for the 28th year this season. Uh, Wouldn't be the same to not uh, scroll down the dial to 1430 and listen to Bill and sometimes Foster describe the Maple Leaf action, the play-by-play, their voices uh, are familiar to just about everybody in Ontario who listens to Toronto games. Uh, Another Toronto note, Jim Proudfoot of the Toronto Star was reporting that a trade rumor that won't go away has the Maple Leafs sending Mike Walton to the Philadelphia Flyers and Doug Favelle would go back to the Maple Leafs. There would be other players involved apparently, but those guys would be the principals. It's well known that Walton, who is married into the Smythe family, has been a thorn in the side of the Smythe, and they would like nothing better but to send him somewhere, preferably out of the Eastern Division. Doug Favell has long been rumored to be made available for trade by the Flyers. Doug really wants to play for Toronto, and he would certainly welcome a deal. One final hockey note this week. The Providence Reds of the American Hockey League, who recently agreed to renew their uh, working agreement with the Oakland Seals, they have named longtime American Hockey League player Larry Wilson as their new coach. I wonder if Larry will get a chance to coach the Seals when the new owners, whoever they are, eventually take over. Larry would be a very good National Hockey League coach, I would think. Very knowledgeable about the game and uh, known as a a guy who will certainly get along with his players. And our, our final note this week concerns the condition of Pittsburgh Penguins center Michelle Breer. Michelle, as you know, was injured in that automobile accident May 15th near Malartic, Quebec, and he's been in a coma ever since. Notre Dame Hospital in uh, Montreal has said that his condition has improved slightly, but he remains in a coma. Penguins coach Red Kelly was uh, spoken to by different reporters this week, and Red uh, said that uh, this he said we saw him three times last week in the hospital in Montreal and it seemed to me that he improved with each visit now Red said that uh, you shouldn't be surprised 
if Briere regained consciousness in the next few days. Red was very optimistic at this time, and I guess we couldn't blame him. He said that he talked to Michelle, and it seemed that he tried to converse with him as well. He appeared to get excited when Red talked, just like he did during the Stanley Cup playoffs, or he talked about winning the Cup or their next game. Michelle seemed to respond. He opened his eyes, but he couldn't move me, just stared straight ahead. But he did grab Red's hand. He said he moved his arm. Uh, he said he squeezed his hand when he talked it, it was very definite reaction red said that he thought that uh, uh, michelle would recover and he hoped that the youngster would be back by christmas the hospital meanwhile said that briere's recovery seemed to be consistent with a person who had uh, suffered the type of injuries he did and the long-term prognosis was very cloudy at this point in time. He remains in a coma. And so, boys and girls, that is our show for this week. A little bit uh, shorter version, not as much news to go on. We'll have to uh, be having some other features incorporated in, in the future this summer. But what did we learn from this episode? Well, we learned that the on-again, off-again sale of the Oakland Seals might just be off again now, or it might be on. It might not go to Charlie Finley. It might go to someone else. No one has a clue. In any event, it sounds like June 29th might be the date in which we possibly get some clarity on this whole stinking mess. We learned the answer to a future crit trivia question, that question being, who was the first player to be signed by the Vancouver Canucks? The answer, of course, is one of hockey's really good guys, goalie Charlie Hodge. And we learned, sadly, that there was great optimism about the condition of young Penguin star Michel Briere, but he still remained in a coma despite positive signs, especially when he was visited by his coach and general manager, Red Kelly. So next week, we have a few stories for you. We'll cover uh, the National Hockey League Players Golf Tournament, which is held at the swanky Toronto Board of Trade Country Club. We'll have uh, some uh, discussion on changes in the landscape of Canadian junior hockey. And we'll uh, have a, a bit of a report from Clarence Campbell, the National Hockey League president, who talks about, believe it or not, yet more National Hockey League expansion, possibly as soon as 1973. And we'll have much more as well. The 50 Years Ago in Hockey podcast is produced by Andy Cole. I can't thank Andy enough for all his hard work he puts into this. You wouldn't believe how much this kid puts into this uh, podcast for us. The very popular Juno-nominated Toronto Indie Rock Group at Rural Alberta Advantage provides our intro and exit music, and we're really hoping that they can get back to performing live all over Canada in the very near future. Other musical pieces and sound effects are by Andy Cole, our research comes from files from the Toronto Star, Toronto Globe and Mail, and of course the many fine publications found at our sponsor, newspapers.com. Don't forget to give a listen to the Council of Council of Dads podcast hosted by Andy Cole and Cole Osborne. Each week they delve very deeply into the television show Council of Dads and provide some hilarious commentary on the goings on with that TV show. You can find us on Twitter at, at Hockey50Years, on Facebook under 50 Years Ago in Hockey, and we have a WordPress site which is Hockey50YearsAgo.com. And of course, you can get us through your favorite podcast app, and now we're on YouTube as well. We enjoy bringing this show to you every week, boys and girls, and we're uh, going to continue through the summer with lots of good plans. On that note, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time. When the